Hey everyone, it's Jesse G. Welcome back to Jesse's Hangout. Welcome, welcome. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are in good health. I hope 2022 brings new beginnings and a new start for everybody. Um, I know 2021 was a real struggle for everybody. It was a really, really bad year for a lot of people. But hopefully this year will bring more positivity and more new beginnings and more good things and with that said you guys can pretty much tell us the title of the episode we are going to be talking about missing and murdered indigenous women missing cold cases um i'm going to be talking about two very extraordinary women um who have went missing and have been missing for quite some time now i'm going to be shedding a lot of light on their cases and talking about their cases and talking about who they were and all of that type of stuff but before I get into that I'm going to read off a couple of things to you guys and then we're going to get straight on into today's episode. Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976 allowances made for fair use for purposes such as comment criticism news reporting teaching scholarship education and research. Fair use is a use permitted by the copyright statute that might otherwise be interfering. Nonprofit or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. This episode is for mature audience only. Viewer discretion is advised. If you are under the age of 18, this episode may not be suitable for you to listen to. If you do choose to listen to today's episode at your own discretion, I highly recommend you seek out parental permission, and I highly recommend that they sit down and listen to today's episode with you. Um, I highly, 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 strongly recommend that. If you are triggered or sensitive to any of the topics that are going to be talked about throughout this episode, I highly recommend that you seek out your emotional support system, such as your significant other. Somebody you love and trust enough that will sit down with you and help you through the emotional and triggering sensitive parts of today's episode. And with that said, let's get straight on into today's episode. First thing I want to talk about, and I don't normally talk about this all the time, but I wanted to put this out there before I get into what I want to read to you guys. The reason for me talking about true crime episodes is not just because of the fact that people find these episodes interesting. For me, it's different. For me, it's about talking about cold cases, shedding light on cold cases, getting the word out there, um, being educated along with you guys about this sort of thing, and doing what I can, being a small channel that I am, and being a small platform that I am, in hopes that this will help somebody who's listening to this. Whoever is struggling through this, whether they be an indigenous person or a non-indigenous person, if they're struggling through this sort of thing and they're not knowing what to do or they just think that they're alone in this, at least these two very extraordinary women's cases will be out there and hopefully it will help somebody who's listening to this. That's why I do these. Um, that's what it is for me. Because if I ever went missing, I would want somebody to talk about my case. Heck, I would want them to boast about it. And you would think that regardless of whether or not you're indigenous or non-indigenous, you would think everybody's cases would be treated equally. But sadly, that's not the case. And that's why, uh, the reason why I'm talking about these cases. Whether they be indigenous or non-indigenous. That's why I shed a lot of light on any case. I'm open to talk about any type of case involving no matter what ethnic background or what race they're from. I will talk about it because I feel the need that they needed to be talked about. They need to be put out there. This is an individual's life. This is somebody who is really missing. This is no joke. This is somebody's loved ones, somebody's partner, somebody something that is missing. And they do and their family deserves to have answers 
their family deserves to have the closure that they deserve. They deserve to have some sort of answer and they deserve to bring their loved ones home. And that's why I talk about this. And that's why I wanted to put this out there. And with that said, I'm going to read off the statistics of the murder rate for indigenous women and girls and teens. And then I'm going to talk about the missing person statistics uh, regarding all indigenous people, uh, not just certain specific uh, genders, all genders. And with that said, let's get into it. Did you know that indigenous women murder rate is 10 times higher than all other ethnicities? Did you also know that mur murder is the third leading cause of death of indigenous women? Did you also know that more than four out of five indigenous women have experienced violence in their lives? About 84.3% of them will experience this or have experienced this. Did you also know that more than half indigenous women have experienced sexual violence in their lives? About 56.1% of them have or will. Did you also know that more than half indigenous women have been physically abused by their intimate partners or in any other case, a family member or somebody that's close to them? About 55.5% of them have experienced this or will experience this. Did you also know that less than half indigenous women have been stalked in their lifetime? About 48.8% of them have or will be. Did you also know that indigenous women are 1.7 times more likely than an Anglo-American to experience violence? Did you also know that indigenous women are two times more likely to be sexually assaulted than an Anglo-American woman or a white woman? Did you also know that the murder rate of indigenous women are three times higher than an Anglo-American woman or an average white woman? And with that said, did you also know that the missing persons cases are ranging from that involve indigenous women or girls or men or boys uh, involving all backgrounds. Did you know that there are anywhere from 6,000 to 7,000 cases out there, possibly more, that involving indigenous uh, peoples? Uh, and only 116 of all of those, out of all of those cases have been put into the system. That's sad. That's sad and horrifying and just mind boggling all the way around. And with that said, this is also the other reason why I talk about this is because of this. It's really, when I started researching this and started diving more into this case and into all of this, part of me knew it was going to be bad. But I'm going to be straight up honest with you all. I did not know that it was this bad. This is bad as bad can go. This is just straight up bad. This is just really bad. And I hope that by shedding light on these two extraordinary indigenous women, I'm hoping that by having you guys learn about them and learn about their cases, will hopefully educate all of us, including me, in hopes that it will get the word out there. And I hope that you guys will share this episode and also give this episode a thumbs up so that way it gets put out there as much as it could get put out there. And I hope that you guys will go and follow any indigenous influencer and um, read any books that have to do with indigenous peoples and whatever issues they are facing and the issues they are facing now i hope that you guys will take the time to listen to them and to educate yourself and i hope that by talking about these two women will hopefully help somebody who's going through this sort of situation and with that said i'm going to get into the first cold indigenous missing persons case now this case was a bit strange for me. 
I'm not going to lie, when I started reading this, I was confused at first. It took me a little bit to kind of get the gist of what was really going on and what was happening in the full story and from what I got from it. Because, you know, everybody gets things from things differently. And from what I was getting from this is basically on November the 25th, 2020, Mary Johnson a.k.a. Mary Davis, um, she had went missing. Allegedly, from what I gathered, supposedly from what was said in the case, she was dropped off by her strange husband with a suitcase at a friend's house on the reservation. Johnson was uh, going to stay there overnight and planned the next day to head out to the couple's house that she was supposed to stay with that was 30 miles away from the friend's house she was staying at. The friend that she was also staying with was supposedly, allegedly supposed to give her a ride to the church where a second man was supposed to pick her up and take her to the couple's house, supposedly. Um, but here's where things kind of got a little, uh, airier, so to speak. Um, there was a, per a second man, the second man she was with, um, well, the second person she was with, I should say, um, he was the one, he was staying at the same house that Johnson was allegedly staying at. And he also needed a ride too. So when he got the ride from the friend, she backed out of it and didn't give Johnson the ride that she needed to the church. And also the second man that was supposed to pick her up also backed out of it too. And I, th I think it was the second or third man that backed out of it. And all because two people needed a ride and they didn't have enough room. My common sense is I would find a way to make room enough to get them to where they needed to get safely. Because walking on a road, regardless of whether you're on a reservation or not, is definitely not the safest thing in the whole world. No matter what ethnic background you're from, walking on any highway or road is dangerous, especially at night or any time of day, because you don't know who you're going to bump into. You don't know what strangers you're going to bump into. You just don't know who you're going to bump into. You could bump into the wrong person. You just don't know. And it's very scary, especially being an indigenous woman. It has to be even more terrifying. I mean, I, I, I can't possibly understand what it's like for them to walk on a street and be absolutely terrified that somebody's going to do something to you. That's pretty horrifying and pretty downright disappointing and just every mixed emotion in the world, to be honest. Um... It was also said on November the 25th the Johnson's uh, friend that was supposed to give her a ride, and the set uh, give her a ride, and the second man a ride had backed out of it, and um, reportedly saw Johnson set out towards the church on foot around 1:30 p.m., and that they allegedly saw the second man walk away from the house. That was supposedly what this friend saw. This is from their statement that was given. Um, the third man that I was talking about that was supposed to pick her up that backed out of it um, saw her walking on fire uh, trail road with the man who was also wanting a ride. Um, so that was another statement that was given. There was also another statement allegedly given by the woman that was the uh, the couple she was supposed to be staying with um, on the Oasis. It said that uh, before she had disappeared, she left the couple a voicemail 
and desperation uh, desperation in her voice as she urged them to pick up the phone. According to records obtained by Everett uh, Heard, um, if I'm saying his last name right, she also made another uh, call around 2.30 p.m. that day. The woman who picked up the phone reportedly said to police that she told Johnson she was too busy to speak. It was also said by police officers that they thought that somebody had uh, picked her up and took her to the Oasis area and that her cell phone pinged off the tower and it stayed at that tower and it died at that tower. Now, here's the, the thing that bothers me the most about this case. First of all, why would a friend back out of taking a friend and another friend safely to their destination, regardless of what the circumstances were? You would think that if you were that good of a friend out of the kind heartness of them you would have thought that they would have went ahead and made sure that they got to where they needed safely regardless of whether or not they were the ones giving them the ride or not that they would have helped them find a ride up there that they would have had the common sense to make sure that these two individuals made it safe you would have thought that but the thing that also um, makes me a little uh, wary as well is the fact that after she had went missing on the 25th, it wasn't until December the 9th of 2020 when the estranged husband filed the missing persons report to the police. You would have thought that after a couple of days of not hearing from her, regardless of whether the marriage was a strain or not, you would have thought that there might have been something wrong and that would have let off a light bulb that, hey, maybe you should call the police and file a police report. At least you would have thought that. But I also have to take into consideration that maybe because of their estranged relationship and their relationship being so strange in the way that it was, because allegedly, according to what I read and from what I gather, she didn't actually live at the same house with her husband. She stayed at multiple friends' houses. She was in and out of their out of their uh, house that they had together. She only went there to get her mail and to take a shower and head back out to whatever friend's house she was staying at. So they really technically weren't really living together because their marriage was that strain and not on good terms so i took that into consideration but still you would think that people would have common sense obviously not because even despite the estranged husband being the way that he was and despite their marriage being estranged he at least made it the effort to take her to a friend's house to drop her off where she was at and make sure that she was okay before he left, even despite the fact that I find it really strange that he waited that long to file that report. So it makes me wonder if he knows more than he's letting on. That's just my opinion. Um, what also makes me worry is the second man she was with. The man that also wanted a ride. That makes me also worry. It makes me wonder if something happened along their walk and he's just not saying anything either. But regardless of the fact that the police department had multiple suspects, no arrests were made. There was nothing done. And her case just went completely cold and everybody stopped talking about it. But the family of this missing woman, Mary Davis, Mary Johnson, uh... They kept going. They kept finding ways to get her story out there, to keep her case alive, because they deserve to have the answers and the closure that they need to find out what happened to their missing loved one. That's what I find really strange about this case is reading that and knowing that there were there was a lot of common sense that could have been done into this 
I can understand that, you know, it might have been a little weary because of the other men that she was with and they don't know them. And, you know, there's a lot of horror stories. But that's no excuse not to take the person that you promised to ride to the place and back out of it. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you back out of that? Regardless of whether or not that second person wanted a ride, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And it still didn't even after reading it again before I did the episode, it didn't make any sense. Um, there was a lot of things that went through a lot of the family's brain that she might have been kidnapped or she might have been murdered or something awful might have happened to her. You know, a lot of things go through your mind when somebody's missing or when something happens to somebody. Or if you haven't heard from somebody in a couple of days, your mind tends to wonder. It tends to go to places that you wouldn't think it would go to and it goes there. And that's pretty scary when it starts going there. And that's, according to this, that's kind of happening with the family. You know, they have all this different scenarios and the what ifs and you know that's just going through their head but you will never possibly ever understand what it's like to walk into their shoes but you know from what you what I've read that your mind tends to go elsewhere because I've had that problem where I've worried about somebody who I haven't heard from in a long time and you start to get worried because you hope that they're okay you hope that they're not dead somewhere or something didn't happen to them that part I can relate to because I've had that happen to me a couple of times and it's scary but to have that happen and then find out that she went missing that's scary that's something I will never understand and I hope that I will never have to understand and I hope I will never have to go through and I hope that any of you guys will never have to go through that I don't wish that on my worst enemy even and to know that this family is still going through it to this day, even, is absolutely mind-boggling and heartbreaking at the same time. And it makes you angry, too. And, you know, I know sometimes that, sometimes the police department are limitless, but that doesn't mean you give up. You still keep trying. You still keep doing it. Even if you're on another case, you still keep going. You still keep looking into it. You still keep getting it out there. You don't just give it up Give it up and sweep it under a rug. It does. You, you, you just don't do that. I mean, what if it was their kid that went missing, regardless of whether they're ethnic backgrounds? You would want somebody boasting about your, your case. And it's sad because... A lot of the police departments won't boast boast about an indigenous person missing. And that's sad. That's another thing I find sad, is, is that particular reason. The next person's missing person's case is another young woman who went missing on March the 9th, 2019. Her name is Audrey Jane Rand. She's still missing. Um, it's been about two and a half, three years now. Uh, she was last seen by her mother, who had apparently woken up at 3 a.m. and happened to see Audrey leaving the house, uh, or getting ready to leave the house, and she had supposedly told her brother and her friend that she was leaving to meet a friend, and she had left the house and was never seen or heard from again. There was no phone call, no text messages, no nothing. Um, they didn't hear anything from her and it started to worry them and that's when the family filed a missing persons case. A missing persons report in this case. Um, a little bit about Audrey Damien, uh, Damien, if I'm saying her name right, or her last name right. Um, she was the kind of person who was a bit, had a big heart. She was the kind of person that would help out anybody. She was the kind of person that would help out her community, her indigenous people who were struggling, who were being bullied by somebody, or who were un unfortunate than she was. And 
She opened her home to people who needed a place to stay. She used her voice to stick up for those who were unfortunate. She was always a person that forgave those who responded out hate towards her. She was always a person that tried to, that would always stay po as positive as she could possibly stay. Um, she just had a really big heart of helping those who needed help. And also, Audrey Damerson was also a transgender person, a transgender woman. Um, Audrey, Audrey's aunt, I think it was aunt or mother, don't quote me on that one, but uh, was allegedly said by the aunt or the mom that they were worried because of the, the police department not taking so much of an interest in her case that they were afraid that they were blaming Audrey's lifestyle for the fact that she went, that the fact that she disappeared. They were thinking that because of the fact that once her case was uh, out there, it wasn't boasted about as much as it should have been. It wasn't put out there as much as it should have been. It wasn't talked about as much as it should have been, like Mary Davis's case. You know, you would think that there, these two individual women who are indigenous would be talked about more, but that's not the case. Um, so her family really struggled, and that's where MMIWUS comes in. And they came in to help these families out, help them uh, uh, charter the rocky roads ahead of them and the system that's messed up, I will say. Um, it's very sad to see these families and hear these families go through that. But also, we as people will never understand what it's like to be an indigenous person who has a missing loved one. Or an indigenous person who's walking a highway and can't walk a highway without worrying about something happening to them. We'll never fully understand that. We'll never fully understand what they go through every day. We will never understand that. Even I will never understand that. But I can always use my platform to get the word out there, to spread the word, to keep talking about it, to keep doing what I can to educate myself and to do what I can to help these families get closure that they deserve and hope one day get the chance to bring their missing loved ones home. And with that said, I hope you guys took a lot out of today's episode. I hope that you guys will continue to talk about their cases. I hope you will continue to spread the word. If you wish to know anything more about um, indigenous people and the, and the issues that they face and everything, I highly recommend you go and check out an indigenous influencers, listen, in, listen to them tell their stories, especially residential survivors. Uh, residential school survivors even um, also there's books out there that you can read about uh, these certain things you can look them up and do research uh, they're out there for people to read and see and form your own opinion and do what you uh, need to do at your own discretion with that and with that said if you haven't already, hit that red subscribe button and that notification bell so you'll be notified as to when I upload videos or other episodes in the future. Also, don't forget to go check me out on my social medias because usually when I do these types of episodes, um, usually an update comes out of them, um, like the Keepers. I did an update with them. Um, I'll keep you up to date if I hear anything about these two women um, in the future. If you want to go check out MMIW, check out their website, check out their Facebook page. If you want to know a little bit more about them, go check out my latest or my last episode uh, before the new year where I talked about them and another nonprofit organization. So go check that out. I hope you guys have an awesome morning, afternoon, or night time wherever you are listening to this from. And I will catch you guys in my next episode later.